the next presenter is uh, Hena Muliana, professor from uh, the Department of English and Comparative Literary Studies at Shaurastra University in India. And the presentation is Ecocritical Reflections on Pastoral Trope. So kind of related to the previous one. Okay, Hena. We don't hear you well, very well. Hello. Hello. Maybe try to reconnect your microphone because we can't hear you. Am I audible now, madam? Yes, much better. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, okay, so I'll be reading on ecocritical, ecocritical reflections on pastoral trauma. And uh, my paper goes like, Cheryl uh, Glotfelty ruminates in the ecocriticism reader landmark in literary ecology on literary studies in an age of environmental crisis, contending that scholarship has ignored the most primary contemporary issues of all, the global environmental crisis. The lack of any trace of environmental perspective in contemporary studies suggests that, although being progressive in its energies, academia remains unaware of the outside world. It has put race, class, and gender as the hot topics of the 20th century, but nowhere it includes Earth's life support system. Media would cover oil spills, lead and abscitose poisoning, toxic water contamination, extinction of species at an unprecedented rate, battles over public land use, protest over nuclear water dumps, a growing hole in ozone layer, prediction of global warming, acid rain, loss of topsoil, destruction of the tropical rainforest, controversy over the spotted owl in the Pacific Northwest, a wildfire in Yellowstone Park, medical syringes washing onto the shores of Atlantic beaches, boycotts on tuna, overtrapped equifiers in the West, illegal dumping in the East, a nuclear reactor disaster in Chernobyl, new auto emission standards, famines, droughts, floods, hurricanes, a United Nations special conference on environment and development, a US president declaring the 1990s, the decades of the environment and world population that topped 5 billion. And in 1989, Time Magazine's Person of the Year Award went to the, uh, the, the Endangered Earth. According to Greg Gerard, even since the Romantic movement has responded to the industrial revolution, pastoral has contributed in our construction of nature. And even Rachel Carson's founding text of ecocriticism, Silent Spring, traces on pastoral tradition for environmentalism. The reason, uh, wait a moment, pastoral provides information on the evolving perceptions, representations, and conceptualization of environment. It does depict a unique job for investigating the relationship the human between the human and non-human, 
Therefore, it is central to contemporary studies on culture and arts. It is because of, because of its long history, pastoral has been a key concern for eco-critics. Pastoral has a long history in literature and other arts more than a genre. It is a mode of writing and hence it has many genres. Greg Gerard mentioned in eco-criticism about pastoral that no other trope is so deeply entrenched in Western culture or so deeply problematic for environmentalism. The reason is its connotation has changed over the course of time due to the rapid change in human intelligence and the greed for science and technology growing intense. Industrial revolution, religion and war has also been the significant reasons the, con uh, uh, reasons the conceptualization of pastoral and, lit and literature has changed drastically. Basically, pastoral is any literature that describes the country with an implicit or explicit contrast to the urban. In pejorative sense, it implies idealization of rural life that obscures realities of labor and hardship. Pastoral is known to have emerged in poetry of the Hellenistic period. The idols of Alexandrian poet Theocritus associated the three terms. The idol was originally the small picture or poetic vignette, but later came to mean the represented situation or rural escape or repose itself. Bucolic derived from the bucolos meaning cowherd, a typical singer of idol, and pastoral, a term from Latin. Latin origin was applied to Theocritus' work where shepherds engaged in singing competitions with the cow and goat herds. This emergence of bucolic idols relates with large-scale urbanization in the Hellenistic period. This idyllic poetry of Theocritus has established a sense of idealization, nostalgia, and escapism in poetry of the countryside, which is written for country country audience. These qualities have keenly come to be associated with the definition of the pastoral. This also has created a characteristic pastoral momentum of retreat and return in the sense that the heightened language of herdsmen of Theocritus speak and delivers to an urban audience in Paul Alper's word, common plights and pleasures with awareness of their limitations. The shepherds in pastoral are representative of every man to readers who recognize the convention of the genre. Therefore, there is in this amalgamation that is often tension between re re realism of close encounters with nature, a simplified life, real transferable learning about inner nature from dealing with and observing outer nature, and the acceptance of a degree of artifice in this construction and its discourse. Thus, Theocritus returns to the Alexandrian court knowledge of human dilemmas played out in intimate con contact with the harsh Sicilian landscape. The two key contrasts from this period in pastoral traditions is the, spe the special uh, distinction of town that is frantic, corrupt, impersonal, and country that is peaceful and abundant, and temporal distinction of past that is idyllic, represented by idyllic, and uh, present that is fallen. Pastoral uses nature as a location or, or as reflection of human predicaments instead of sustaining nature in and for itself. And in modern time, it has also been used as a tool of capitalism. Many modern adv advertisements for whole wheat bread feature idyllic rolling fields of grain in the sunshine, populated by ruddy farmers and backed by classical music. Retreat and return has been a defining feature of this form of cultural equipment, and it has been central to the earliest ecocritical writing, which in the US discussed journeys of retreat into wilderness, depicted by Barry Lopez in Arctic Dreams, and the wild depicted in Henry David Thoreau's Walton. On the contrary, in the British ecocriticism, on the other hand, the journeys were less important than the return from close contact with nature in the novels of Thomas Hardy and in contemporary nature poetry. The return here is in two ways. Uh, it is literal and metaphorical. It is this reason that pastoral is useful for ecocriticism. Terry Gifford, an eminent literary theorist, defines pastoral in three ways in his critical book named Pastoral. The first focus, the first focuses on the hierarchical, hierarchical literary perspective of the pastoral in which author recognizes and discusses life in the country and in particular the life of a shepherd, which Leo Marx phrases as no shepherd, no pastoral. The second type is of the pastoral literature that describes the country with an implicit or explicit contrast to the urban and the third type of pastoral depicts the country life with derogative classifications. Theocritus and Virgil's poetry represent Gifford's first type of pastoral. 
Even Hesoit's work and days depicts a golden age when people live together in harmony with nature. The passionate shepherd to his love by Christopher Marlowe presents the second type of pastoral, where the title shepherd idealizes urban material pleasure. Responding to the simplified pleasures of pastoral ideology. Marlowe uses words like lion slippers, purest gold, silver jewelry tapers. The shepherd does not converse with the true shepherd and nature, but his love, which reflects the change in relationship between man and nature, leading towards Anthropocene outlook, where man is using nature for his own pleasures instead of writing about, about or for nature. Terry G. Ford defines antipastoral in his 2012 essay, Pastoral, Antipastoral, and Postpastoral as Reading Strategies, as an explicit correction of pastoral, focusing on realism over romance, tracing out problematic elements like tensions, disorder, and inequalities, challenging literary constructs as false distortion and mythical locations uh, such as Arcadia, uh, as a as to idealizing shepherds of the passionate shepherd to his love by explaining the real by using phrases like rivers rage, rocks grow old, one can feel, fill or melt down. This depicts that man only need nature as far as he can use it. This utility purpose strongly depicted postmodern capitalistic utility tendency of human beings. In this period of England's, England's history, there are also poets like Sir Philip Sidney, who explored the theme of antipastoral in his uh, The 23rd Psalms and The Ninth Angle. In the formal, formal poem, Sidney depicts nature as something we need to be protected from. And in The Ninth Angle, the woo of Philomela is compared to speaker's own pain. The earliest topic of Gilgamesh, stressing back to Sumeria, has also depicted nature as harms human beings. Many scholars in an example that what interests us about the epic of old is the fact that the first antagonist of the Gilgamesh is the forest. Virgil alluding to Theocritus in his scholars mentioned the contrast between rural retreat and the harm consequent on civilization. He alludes to the problems associated with Roman civilization, which are responsible for decline of Rome. The key factor was deforestation. Even in Milton's narratives, each is a political material, pastoral eater, the result of great Roman models, are in a shadow and a quote, oh, and a second stroke, worse than of death, must I leave the paradigm? Uh, I'm sorry, I was uh, deconnected. Uh, am I audible now? Hello. Yes. Okay. Uh, I continue. Also, the covenants between man and God depicts the possibility of God's promise to continue nature as a part of covenant. Lynn White Dare has claimed based on Genesis that a Christian that Christianity in absolute contrast to ancient paganism and Asia's religions not only established a dualism of man and nature, but also insisted that it is God's will that man exploit nature for his ends. And Lim concludes that we shall continue to have worsening ecological crisis until we reject the Christian axioms that nature for and Williams, the meanings and values implied to pastoral allergy and idol change according to the historical context that they appear, but the classical English pastorals influenced by Theocritus to present a vision of rural life which so removed from the process of labor and natural growth that they consist of mystification of human ecology. Raymond Williams' key insight is that Pastoral always has been character characterized by nostalgia, so, so that wherever we look into hi its history, we will see an escalator taking us back further into a better past. At the same time, he argues, what seemed a single escalator 
perpetual procession into history turns out on reflection to be more complicated movement. Old England settlement, the ruler virtue, virtues, all these in fact mean different things at different times and quite different values are being brought into question. According to Greg Gerard in his eco-criticism in works of Raymond Williams, John Barron, and John Bull, there is an emergent sense of Gifford's pastoral as a pejorative term for an evasive and mendacious depiction of rural life. They betray two pre preoccupations, an interest in the convention of pastoral poetry themselves, and with just as much self-regard and often psychophancy too, the land as the countryside. In to Saxham by he compliments a patron's bounty so joyfully, as in Butcher's Adam, he mentioned in in poem uh, to Saxon, and I quote, the pheasant, patridge, and the lark flew to their house as to the ark. The willing ox of himself came home to the slaughter with the lamb, and every beast did thither bring himself to be an offering. The scaly herd more pleasure took bathed in that dish than in the brook. Thus, classical pastoral was disposed of to distort and mystify social and environmental history, and at the same time provides a focus legitimated by tradition for the feeling of loss and alienation from nature to be produced by the industrial revolution. Industrial revolution and romanticism brought a shift in relation of the country and the city. According to Kate Thomas, during the early modern period and in 18th century, there had gradually immersed attitudes to the natural world, which were essentially incompatible with the directions in which English society was moving. The growth of towns had led to new longing for the countryside. The progress of cultivation had fostered a taste for weeds, mountains, and uns uh, unsubdued nature. Pastoral and Romantic Age confronts progress. Roger Sell contended about Michael, a pastoral poem by Wordsworth, depicting the hardship of the shepherd Michael and his wife. There is no specific allocation of blame or detailed sociopolitical diagnosis amounts to a blatant example of what one might call pastoral kish. According to him, Wordsworth's poem is a cynical advertising voice using image of a cheerful farmer's wife at work on an antique spinning wheel to sell us old-fashioned hand-kneaded soaps. He comments that the, uh, under the harmonious vision of rural, in, rural independence and fortitude, Wordsworth hides a harsh world in which people are brought and sold at hiring fairs, where customary tenure keeps Cumberland statesmen like Michael in a state of feudal vassalages to local aristocrats who are nevertheless equally adept at capitalist wage-best forms of exploitation. Although Sal does not mention Michael's attunement with nature, which shows man's relationship with nature, with, which is the earliest trait of pastoral tradition, Wordsworth says in the poem. Hence, he had learned the meaning of old winds, of blast of every tone, and oftentimes, when others he did not, he heard the south make subterraneous music like the noise of bagpipers and highland hills. John Clare has better claim to be a nature poet than Wordsworth. John Middleton Murray praised him, saying, I quote, the intensity with which he adored the country, which he, which he knew is without parallel in English literature. Of him, it seems hardly a metaphor to say he was an actual part of the countryside. Many critics think of Clare's poetry as naive because his poems are distinct in poetic voice. In his poem, Amon Sales Heath in Winter, he uses unpunctured form, idiosyncratic spelling like brick, uh, rather than bridge, grammatically incorrect dialectic words such as oddling for solitary, bombarrel for long tail tit, o for hope, clausen for small fields. Greg Gerard mentions in his book Eco Criticism that Claire was killed in artifice of and study of natural history and his natural surroundings. Like, I love to see the old heats withered, bread. Mingle its while the old heron from the lonely lake starts slow and flaps his melancholy wings. He begins the poem with unaffected love of place, which is treated as empty, wild, and reclatent re space. In his letter poems, such as The Moors, Helpstone, and To a Fallen End, he described the destruction of known landscape. Raymond William argued 
uh, for John Clare and, and to do whatever he liked with it. Instead, he must treat it as responsible steward for his own sake and that of other species, that is rabbit, ants, and cattle, which also have a right to exist. Dylan Thomas, two poems, Fawn Hill and Poems in October, depicts the myth of reality and the Garden of Eden. The lessons of Adam and Eve by eating forbidden apple suggest the human beings trapped in uh, that human beings are trapped in complexities and natural pastoral of the past. The loss of nature relates to the loss of Garden of Eden. Eco critics have given modern interpretations of the allegory of God turned against nature. They were expelled from the Garden of Eden. Dylan Thomas recognizes this expulsion in poems in October as gates of the town closed and it turned away from the bleak country. And in Fawn Hill uh, uh, represents the Garden of Eden as apple towns can be compared to. Uh, and I conclude that thus the primary theme of the pastoral is depiction of simple life of a shepherd, the divide between city and country and the relationship between human being and nature. But as due to the industrialization, war, religion, and influence of science and technology, the treatment of pastoral talk in poetry other forms of art has been changed frequently and it also signifies the idea of lost innocence, paradise life in which man lived with nature in harmony. The climate crisis hit as the climate uh, the climate crisis hit the earth globally, the need for a varied uh, form of pastoral shows in Bill's words, and I quote. A species of cultural equipment that Western thought has for more than two millennia been unable to do without, and I unquote. And that is all. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Are there any questions? If nothing, we can move on to the next present.